Hang on a second. Welcome to Bows and Arrows, boys. Roger Massey, hello. How are you? Pedro Portella, how are you doing? Hi there. I'm going to jump straight in and ask you to define what, um, uh, what traditional archery is in a f just a few sentences. Fire away, um, Pedro. <laughs> Yeah, so traditional archery, I think it's um, it's very much, uh, well, uh, it's really a section of field archery of uh, shooting, um, shooting basically in the woods with, um, with, with non-compound kit, really, and maybe with our crossbows as well. Uh, it's just basically a, a, what, what, what the Americans call a stick bow. Um, even if, you know, we're, we're talking about higher tech, uh, bows with aluminum risers or whatnot, um, the, the, the skill, the skill is very much the same and, um, well, having a connection with, with the arrow, the arrow trajectory, etc., and, and without sights, I think, um, it's very much a training for hunting as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. Roger? Well, you've given me plenty of time to prepare for this one, and I'll, I'll try it's, and answer it. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost like we've been here before. Yeah, that's it, deja vu. But uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, traditional archery is simple archery. So you're not complicating things with uh, stabilizers, sights. You've basically got a bow with a string uh, and arrows, and you're going out there and you're trying to shoot stuff. Uh, you know, whether that's on a, a 3D field course or just walking around the woods stumping. I, I don't like stumping. I like shooting leaves. I don't shoot tree stumps. Uh, so it's basically just a, a very simple setup. Um, and I think fundamental to traditional archery is feeling at one with your equipment. So you have a good understanding of what's going to happen to that arrow when you loose it. Uh, where it's going to go all the way through that trajectory uh, as opposed to, to sighted archery. So I think the, the key things for me are keep it simple or it being simple um, and uh, just being out there having fun really. I mean whether it's an alloy riser uh, or wooden risered bow, long bow, flat bow, recurve, anything that bends but just a bow, string and arrows. Do you, um, do you describe yourself as an instinctive shooter? Uh, my thinking on it is there are very, very few truly instinctive archers. Uh, a lot of people think they are, but they're not. <laughs> uh, I would say I shoot instinctively up to about probably 40 meters, something like that. Um, any long shots for me are calculated. I don't think you can shoot instinctively unless you shoot the distances very, very regularly. So multiple times a week. Um, if you want to do it well, that is. I mean, anybody can shoot instinctively, draw a bow, loose an arrow. They're going to hit something, but it's probably not what they want to hit. Yeah. So if you're going to shoot instinctively and do it well, you need to shoot those distances a hell of a lot. Um, so anything over about 40 meters, I'll think where I need that arrow to be in my, my, my sight picture. I won't put my point on something, but I know where that arrow is. Uh, I know what my point on is. It'll be between 45 and 50 meters, something like that. Uh, and I will try and work the distance out on those long shots. But anything up to about 40 meters, I'll get to the peg. Uh, I'll have a look. Uh, my brain does a bit of stuff. Uh, I'll draw the bow and I'll shoot it and hopefully hit it. But I don't think people do enough long shots to be able to do them well instinctively. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's kind of where I am with it, but I, I don't know whether I could have um, explained it quite as eloquently as that. Pedro, what about you? Uh, well, I, 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 I tried the gap stuff and I just, it's just, Frankly, it's just too boring. Um, 
because I, I I get lost in 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 getting the point of the arrow where 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 it needs to be and whatnot. So it's it's very much like Roger. I know the my point on um, which uh, d depending on on the setup I'm using. If if it's my 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 um, my hunting setup, I'm using really heavy arrows. And so their um, their point on is something like eighteen yards, uh, and then and then they they just they just drop, um, and uh, uh, but but then I I'm I'm aware of the trajectory of the arrow, so um, yeah, as I said, just look at the peg, uh, get to the peg, and look at the the target, and um, pre-visualize the trajectory of the arrow. And uh, yeah, nine times out of ten, um, it, it it gets there. I mean, the eternal struggle to me, and I think to a lot of archers, is to try and get the same, uh, you know, the same power to the arrow at all times with the same kind of release um, at, at all times. And I think that's that, that's my that's the struggle I have. Um, but in terms of um, I, I I don't really do the gap stuff, so I'm mostly instinctive. But it's it's never a pure a pure instinct. I'm always aware of where where the arrow is, uh, if if anything for for alignment purposes. But um, I'm always aware. I mean, yeah, th there's that that so there, there's a video where people do a test of of uh, shooting in a in a in a dark room, uh, and um, the arrows just go berserk because <laughs> you don't really you're not really aware, and you thought you were instinctive, but you're not, you're not really. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've actually done things like that, Pedro, and ended up with some lovely groups. Um, <laughs> what I used to only ever shoot wearing contact lenses, and I'm, I'm pretty much blind. Anything uh, else? <laughs> so if I did, you wear anything else apart from the contact, contact lenses? Contact lenses in to shoot. I'd go outside into the back garden, take my well. I wouldn't have my glasses on because they'd get in the way of my anchoring. Did you have so any clothes on? Shoot. Pardon? Any clothes on or just the contact yeah, lenses? Yeah, yeah, clothes on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have been out there in my underwear before and I shoot him, but no, just because I wanted to do one or two and that's all I had on. But uh, I'd go out there, take my glasses off so I could anchor properly, and I'd put three or four arrows into a box. And I wouldn't have a clue where they are in that box until I walked up to it. And you can end up with some really, really nice groupings just because you're so relaxed and in everything you're doing and you're not caring where the arrows are going, but they end up where you want them to be. No, I, together anyway. <laughs> I, can, I can understand that out in the garden in the summertime in your underpants, no glasses on. Yeah, it's going to make any group. <laughs> <laughs> you... yeah. Anyway, here's a question for you guys. Uh, do you feel that a faster bow is a better bow? If, if you've got the stability um, with that bow. So is a faster arrow always better for accuracy? No, I don't think. I don't think. Well, I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer to this, but I've, I've come to my own conclusions for myself. Well, my, 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 my answer to it is, is that um, it, it comes down to the trajectory of the arrow that's convenient to the distance you're actually shooting. Um, because I, I, I um, g going back to when I was doing my, my, uh, the, the hunting exam, there they have this test, which is you have to shoot four discs of six inches at uh, 20 yards. And you have, you have five arrows to shoot those four discs. You can miss once. <laughs> And um, when I first started trying to train for it with my field arrows, they were just, they were just too light for it. And so they went with incredible speed, but my gap was enormous. When I made new arrows with, I think they're, yeah, they're, they're short of 600 grains. They're 570 grains. Yeah, I think 570. Um, they um they are, they had a point on of eighteen yards and so um, the kind of trajectory was much more natural um, and I I I could I could be a lot more instinctive and shoot a lot more relaxed um, because the trajectory of the arrow was was already much more natural to my positioning of yeah. the bow. 
Yeah. Um, what was the question, Roger? Was it is a is a is a faster bow a better bow or a more accurate bow? In terms of accuracy, do you feel that if your bow, the bow you're shooting now, if that was faster, another ten feet per second faster, do you think you could be more accurate with it? Uh, over distance, definitely. Yeah, I do actually. I do because. Um, I, you know, when when you swap around, you muck around with your bows, you know, the various bows that you have. Um, I realised that I can be a lot more. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, a lot more direct in every way with with a, with my fastest bow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I could. I literally. Okay. I know that because I've got a pretty much a flat trajectory out to out to about thirty five forty. Yeah, um, I'm. Pr that's, I'm that's pretty, interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm confident that uh, that it's more accurate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree. Well, I do agree with what Pedro was saying. I've I've come to the conclusion that I shoot my best with reasonably quick bows, so 170, 180 feet per second. Um, I always use a Mediterranean loose, and I don't anchor really high, so I, I kind of anchor there. I mean, it's, it's fairly high, but not ridiculously high. I can't anchor higher because I've got a dodgy shoulder and it, it makes it bad. So I'm stuck with my, my anchor point. And because of that, uh, if, my, if I have a really fast bow, uh, I was shooting a covert hunter a few months ago uh, and that was just crazy. But if the bow is too quick, the arrow relative to my line of sight is traveling up for so long and so quick that it, about 40 yards, I, I would be two feet over a target. Um, and so I'd actually ha have to have me, my arrow, if I was gapping, I'd have to be four or five feet under the target to hit it. Uh, with a bow in the 170, 180 feet per second, uh, you know, I still have huge kind of gaps, but instinctively up to 40 meters or so, I can cope with them really well. and. It just feels right. It's, so a it's, faster bow for me isn't always better. Okay, and it and it kind of goes down. It's down that route that you were talking about with um, uh, with compound archery is losing that connection with the arrow. Yeah, yeah. I exactly, mean, with a faster that's bow, exactly why. It, you you lose that contact with the arrow yourself. Um, you just see where it lands. Whereas I know when I'm shooting me. The big heavy wooden arrows from a flat bow, I, I know where that arrow is going to be throughout the whole trajectory from leaving the bow to, to where it hits the target. Uh, I can stand on a, on a peg on a course and I might see a, a little twig or a branch 10, 15, 20 meters away, whatever, and I will know where my arrow is going to go relative to that. Um, and sometimes I'll get on that peg and I'll say, I'm going to hit that little twig on the way through. And I do. Um, if you're shooting a compound or anything with sights, you, you lose all that connection. And for me, a lot of the enjoyment is understanding what's actually happening with the equipment and where that arrow should end up. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't always end up there, but yeah, I didn't have as much connection with it. Uh, so I actually owned it for about two weeks to covert hunt. So I just couldn't, get on with it <laughs> amazing bits of engineering but no not for me yeah i've shot i've shot lighter way lighter arrows at, than than where i do at the moment and um my accuracy didn't didn't go they did, did, didn't go up with 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 the lighter arrows i used to shoot so yeah i, I reckon yeah that's that's still my my go a faster bow isn't always um uh, better yeah, yeah. I mean, if you were shooting three fingers under and anchoring really high and, and basically barreling down the arrow, speed is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if you're anchoring lower, uh, it's not. Yeah, that's, that's how I shoot. But even so, I, yeah. I heard that you're, um, uh, that you're playing around with or experimenting with shelfless bows, Roger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a Jack and Ori now. Uh, as in, not, a, not an untruth, this is a true story. Uh, so basically, 
on eBay about two years ago, I bought a, a bow made by Mike Roberts from Eclipse Archery. Um, and I've got it here actually behind me. So it's a very simple bow. It's Ipe, or one piece of Ipe and bamboo backed, just Mosso bamboo backed. And I got this bow about two years ago and I shot it in the garden with some arrows I thought would work with it and I was really disappointed with it. And I parked it, I was shooting a longbow at the time I bought this and the performance of the longbow was fantastic. Uh, same poundage and I was quite disappointed with this bow that I bought. So I just parked it and forgot about it. And then last summer I got it out and I just had this sudden urge to go and shoot it. And I hadn't shot it since I bought it, uh, you know, having parked it. And I went onto the course and I shot the best I've ever shot. <laughs> and uh, to this day, it, it just completely wowed me. Um, and I had the best round I've ever had. I didn't miss all evening. Uh, and it just made me think, you know, the focus on speed, focus on making heavy riser bows, long riser bows, carbon, bamboo cores, all focused on performance. And yet I went out and I shot the course with a, a bow that's, <laughs> that's shooting off the hand and obviously similar kind of thickness to a, a long bow. Yeah. And they could shoot like that. I mean, I've, I've struggled to actually repeat that, but I have still shot pretty well with it. So at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm making a bow very similar to this, except it's going to be reflex deflex. And the, instead of just one piece of epe on the, on the uh, or behind the bow, there's, there's actually three. Uh, and I've got internal taper in it as well. Uh, so yeah, it's the, it's the first primitive flat bow I've ever made. And I'm just messing around really, filling a bit of time in lockdown. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the cat amongst the pigeons and uh, and and get people to comment below about whether that is actually a primitive bow. And I know I know that you do your research, and I know that you're always nearly always right about <laughs> about these things. But it will be interesting to see um, what people that shoot sticks think about that. In terms of the NFAS uh, definition, it is definitely a primitive flat bow. But yeah. you know. I'd much rather be shooting a stick if I could get a nice stick. What but, do you think? What do you think Phil Marr would say about it? Oh, Phil would be dead against it. Definitely, <laughs> anything laminated isn't. Uh, but you know, I, I don't have any nice wood to actually make a bow out of. I don't want to make a bow out of a, a piece of ash or anything that's going to be real thumpy and kind of pull all my joints apart. You know, every time I loose it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's. It's whatever you want to shoot, really. I mean, I, I, I will only shoot bows that I'm going to enjoy shooting. And that bow Mike Roberts made from Eclipse, I enjoy shooting it. So I'm trying to make something that I'm going to enjoy shooting. Was it? Is it thumpy? It looks kind of... Kind of... No, it's not at all. No, it's... it's well, it's obviously thumpier than a, a, a modern composite bow. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's a, a nice bow to shoot. I don't come back having thought I've had a, a big workout and my wrist's aching. Yeah, have have you ever seen have you ever seen slow motion um, uh, hit from a uh, from a thumpy bow? I, mean, I I was quite surprised about what what it actually does, and it um, it it leaps forward, doesn't it? That's that's the problem. It leaps forward and it pulls your wrist joint and your and your elbow joint apart. Yeah, I mean, I I suffer from kind of aching wrist. Uh, if I shoot a long bow for too long, or, or I, I do a lot of arrows. So if I'm getting into shooting a long bow, then even like a, a 40 pound bow, which is about where I shoot now. Yeah, you can't uh, have too many, can you? No, that's, that's it. I mean, you know, I ended up doing a shoot at Company of 60, actually, and I, I was all strapped up <laughs> because it was, I was in that much pain. Now, the first 10 targets were great, but after that, I was just in agony. <laughs> Pedro, you you use yeah. when I first shot with you, mm -hmm. you had a you had a primitive bow. 
I, mean, I did. It was, I, um, it was a single piece I bought of wood. A bow, <laughs> I bought a bow out, uh, off eBay, which was um, uh, was a, was was effectively a stick. Um, uh, it was uh, well, I can't remember the wood exactly. Um, was it Osage? No. Uh, well, I had two primitive bows. One of them wasn't a really primitive bow in uh, in Enfast terms because it was a carriage bow. It was actually, I, I ended up selling it to Roger uh, later on. Um, uh, it, it was an Osage bow, that one. But the other one was, um, was the other one made by, made, made uh, of, uh, that, 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 it, it's, it's a really sought after wood. Um, you? You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was mostly it was mostly um, it was mostly sapwood, so it wasn't very it wasn't very fast. Uh, yeah. And um, but I shot I shot great with it, and um, I even won um, a, a nice trophy at Fleet Ibex with it. But um, yeah, I ended up becoming bored. Um, yeah, so I. I remember, I remember shooting with you at uh, Magna Carta with your, with your, um, with your primitive bow. You, d you shot really, really well. And then I saw you about a week later and you chipped it in for a Howard Hill. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. you went, you went kind of American longbow. Are they, for... are they not primitive bows? No, they've got shelves. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, you, they, you they know do. damn well they've got a shelf. <laughs> <laughs> primitive they are, design. They're though. almost primitive. They're almost primitive. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I've kind of, I've, I've kind of went. Yeah, I started with a with a flat bow, went down to to primitives, and then went up to to a to basically a modern recurve. Really, um, does this look primitive to you, Roger? <laughs> oh, it, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's straight, isn't it? It's flat. It is flat. <laughs> That's <laughs> flat. Yeah, no. Flat. I mean, that, uh, great design, good fun to shoot. But uh, you know, in, in terms of flat bows, the you know it's just an old design, isn't it? Yes, yeah, and that's why I, I, I'm going to be really, really uh, keen to see your um, your reflex primitive. Well, I can't, I can't be wait bang before you get to see it. But... I can't wait to see it. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Um, is there anything that Pedro wants to ask Roger? I don't know if Pedro wants to ask anything. <laughs> Let's ask um, Pedro. Ask Pedro. <laughs> no, but but um, I'm I'm um, apart. Do, do you do you intend do you intend to, to um, do you have sort of um, the, the buzz you've been making? Is there is there sort of a, a line, a model, or or is or you just uh, make whatever comes up comes to mind? Can I just can I just can I just jump in here just for a second because people need to need to have a little bit of background and know that you uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong you have bought or uh, or taken over Andy Saw's um, bow forms. I'm sure it's more complicated than that. So what what happened there? You you, you know Andy Saw's is Andy. Saw's. Yeah, I mean it's, it's the story is basically I was. I'd started making my own bows, just messing around. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite bow at the time was a, a Black Brook TDR recurve. Um, amazing bow, absolutely loved it. And I broke the riser on it. I, I dry fired it and cracked the riser. Um, so I made myself a riser for the bow. And one of Andy's friends saw a picture I posted on Facebook and basically he got in touch with Andy and Andy got in touch with me saying, oh, it looks, looks quite nice. And I said, I said, oh, I was, I was actually going to get in touch with you and have you make me another riser? And Andy said, well, I've actually retired um, and I'm, I'm looking to sell my bow forms. And I know Andy had, had spoken to real bowyers. I'm not a real bowyer, but he, he'd spoken to professional bowyers and, there's interest in them, but you know they all had their own designs. Um, so I ended up buying the the Blackbrook bow forms that, that Andy still had. Didn't have a, a full range of them, but I've got the, the 
the Black Brook Sigma and Zeta forms, which are the, the AFBs. Um, I've got the Tanto plans as well, which is a recurve with uh, the limbs from underneath the riser. Uh, I've got a, a hybrid uh, form, and I also have the Black Brook Hunter form, which is a, a 60 or 61 inch recurve. I've made a 61 inch one. Um, so I, I do make those bows. Uh, I don't want to do it for a living. It's, it's nasty, dusty work. I love doing it. Uh, I enjoy making bows for myself more than anybody else. Um, I feel pressure when I'm making a bow for somebody else, uh, both time pressure and quality of what you're producing. I don't mind a few flaws in the finish on a bow that I make for myself, but if I'm selling one, then I, I want it to be right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically my bow making background. Last year I made about a dozen bows. Uh, never really plan on making more than half a dozen, but it, I seem to go over that <laughs> um, and probably sell half of those. The others either go to friends or family or, or me. <laughs> what was that question you asked again, Pedro? Sorry, I, I kind no, of... I was, I was asking because, well, you already half, probably half answered it, but you, you have the, the forms of the, uh, of, of the, um, of the former black brook bows yeah. but uh, do you do you what what the the stuff you make the bows you make are, are they yeah. do they are they are they aligned or is it just what the design you come up with or uh, uh, well the the bows using the the black brook forms I, I got a load of intellectual property off Andy Andy Saws when I, I got the forms and mm -hmm. Andy's been absolutely brilliant in terms of answering all, all my stupid questions on what I should do and how I do it. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he has been incredibly good. Uh, so I've, I've got recipes for making, say, a, a 38 pound carbon backed Sigma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I can make bows to, to set poundages. Um, do I have a range of bows? I have the forms, I can make those bows. Um, but if somebody I don't know approaches me to make a bow, I'll probably say no. Uh, if somebody I know approaches me to make a bow, I might say yes, I might say no. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not looking to make a living at it, Pedro, uh, yeah. but I, I will make bows for people I know, know and, and trust. Uh, I won't make one for you though, Pedro, because I know you blow bows up. I've seen <laughs> at least three or four go bang on you. <laughs> Indeed, that's true. And you and you would get bored with it in about five minutes and and change because I've never seen. Yeah, I went through more bows than than I than I can um, than I can say on screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, never never the same thing twice. It's so fickle. <laughs> that's it. Now, that's the other thing with with making bows. It's it's nice to know I can do it now because I can do it and I can do it yeah. well. Um, in fact, the first. Black Brook Sigma I made is the one that I won the 3D chance with last time it was on. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just it's nice to be able to do it. Uh, I do get bored making the same bow over and over. Um, so if I had to make three Sigmas a week or a month, uh, I can't do three in a week. It takes me about a week to make one. I just yeah. get incredibly bored. Um, but it's, it's like making the primitive flat bow. I... I've never done one before, uh, so I've had to work out how to how to do various things on it, and I put a bit of thought into the design. Uh, I've been lucky that I've got this one from that Mike Roberts made, and I've used that as a little bit of a basis for the thickness of it uh, and the design, because I know that's a nice one to shoot. Um, it's quite interesting. Most, most bowyers uh, probably, when they're designing a new bow, find a design they like and then tweak it a bit yeah uh, yeah and so they should do you yeah. pedro are you a um are you a tab man or a glove man i'm a tab tab man yeah absolutely um i've i've been i've been through gloves but i i could never find a glove that um well the, the glove breaks in as it starts breaking in and there's a, a very short window to me anyway uh, where the glove actually feels good to shoot, yeah. And then it just starts. And then it just starts going too thin, and uh, and then I, I just need to get a new one. With tabs, 
I mean, maybe I found the right tab and never found the right glove, but with tabs, I've, I found, um, yeah, I found tabs that I can, I can get through, you know, two seasons with, with the same. Um, and, and then, uh, well, with the same, with, with a pair of them, because I always have to, because I, I lose the bloody things uh, if, if, I, if I don't have, um, if I don't have to. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, um, I'm, I'm absolutely a tab. And it also helps with my, my anchoring. It's the, the glove um, gives me too much freedom. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely right. I, I started... Uh... I'm I was just going to say, Pedro, yeah. do you do you make your own tabs? Or... No, no, no. I use the same. Um, I mean, I've 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 had to go in making them. It wasn't too bad. It was just it was it was um, it was very thin for what I needed for the poundage I needed. I I I tend to use the the um, the black wither ones. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I know you make your own, uh, Ian, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I yeah. I kind of um, I started with gloves, and I kind of got the same feeling as um, Pedro described, where they you know they have they're, they're optimal for a for a little while after they're broken in, and then they just they just get too thin and too uh, I don't know, just knackered, and yeah. and they and they make your sh I I just think it's really hard to get a you know consistent shots off of them, uh, and then I yeah. then I, I I actually bought this, so it just made me think about it. Can you see this thing? This, this That's is like a, yeah. an instrument of torture there, Ian. Yeah, it looks like a, a, a Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a Howard Hill, um, it's a Howard Hill, genuine Howard Hill. Um, uh, uh, glove. Shooting glove. Shooting glove. <laughs> and uh, it's appalling. <laughs> yeah. I, can't shoot, yeah. I can't shoot anything with it and uh yeah so I, then, I, then i kind of went down the the line of um making my own Taps. quite robust yeah. thick kind of yeah. saddle, saddle leather split finger <laughs> finger divider I've, kind of yeah. tabs and i love them yeah I've, I've tried all sorts and i came to the conclusion i prefer a tab definitely but all i use is a, a single piece of leather uh it's about mill and a half thick and that's it um i've tried lots and lots of different types of tabs that you can buy but i find i like quite a thin tab and i like the flesh on flesh when when i'm actually anchoring um i have no problems holding holding the, the, the bow weight on on a, a thin tab my fingers don't suffer from it um and it's what i enjoy and uh, just just cut one out of a simple piece of leather. Uh, it's hard wearing. I, I've never worn a tab out. <laughs> I, I usually lose them, but I, and yeah. when I do lose a tab, I feel as though somebody's chopped my leg off as well. Oh my god! Yeah, they're so personal. They're so personal, and they get you know they really they get good to you, don't they? And um, you know, I'm, so, I, I mean, what I do do is I use talcum powder on my tab. Oh, wonder what you were going to say then. You get a really nice slick loose with it, and also when it's raining, if you've got a leather tab, uh, they start getting a bit sticky. Yeah, yeah it tries if, you put, yeah. if you put talcum powder on it just before you shot, you'll get a you know at least a, a clean shot off, clean loose. I've also tried making or tried finding coverings for tabs that, that will give a nice slick loose, regardless of the weather. I know there's uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Uh, Spigarelli use it on one of their tabs. Uh, it's it's like a, a rubbery thing, but it's it's got silicon in. It's really slick. Um, I tried making all kinds of things, uh, but I I just stick with a simple leather tab now. Yeah, I've seen um, I've seen snakeskin tabs, um, which kind of slip off past the 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 uh, the scales on the snakeskin, and I've also oh, seen a, and I've seen reindeer skin or reindeer fur tabs. Which uh, which seemed quite good. Yeah. Um, I, tried, I tried a hair tab for a while because I, I I sell the bear paw hair tabs and they're great in terms of the the loose you get. But I, I found I was actually allergic to the hair on it and I was getting a rash <laughs> on my face. <laughs> so I, I had to stop that one. But uh, yeah. Oh, in terms of of leather as well. I mean, uh, you, you can buy obviously lots of different types of leather. Um, Cordovan uh, is is meant to be the best. Is that a leather? I thought that was a I thought that was a 
synthetic, like a... No, cordovan is uh, horse leather, basically, but there's a particular cut called shell cordovan, and off, off a horse, uh, you know, you, you end up with a piece about that big, that's about 12 inches. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an oval shape. Yeah. That's what you get off one horse. So you probably get two, one from each side of the horse. Yeah. And that's the shell cordovan, and it's treated in a certain way. And that's meant to make the best tabs. Um, basically, you can buy cordovan, but that's usually just horse leather. But if you buy shell cordovan, it, it's mm. got to meet certain criteria. Um, and I bought a piece of this shell cordovan. It's very, very expensive. It's, it was about 13 quid for a piece about that big. You're kidding. <laughs> and I made wow. a tab out of it. Uh, similar thickness to the tab, my, my cheap leather thing I use at the moment. And I couldn't get on with it. <laughs> so I just stick with simple leather and you know it works. Excellent. Um I'm gonna ask just one more thing before before we have to go because I've got um I'm 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 gonna be chatting today to uh Gordon Monaghan. Oh Gordon's great. Yeah, I've been down there and shot with Gordon. And he's uh yeah, he's a he's a he's a fascinating dude. Um but I've got it. I've got him lined up for about kind of uh, three thirty today. So um, I, I, I've got, I'll probably have to make this conversation that we're having part one of two. If that's all right with you, boys. Yeah. Uh, before we uh, before we cut off though, Ian. Yeah. I've got this uh, little trick I'd like to show you. All right. Yeah. So when you're checking an arrow for straightness, there's various things you can do. All right. You can you can look down it. And you can spot fairly big bends. They work quite well. You can spin it on your hand like that and get it spinning really quick. Yeah. There's another way. You put the point in the palm of your hand. You're going to be trying this later and you're going to fail to start with. But if you persevere, it works. So you put the point in your hand, hold the shaft between your finger and your thumb, and you blow on the feathers. And if it's a straight arrow, the knock spins you know, centrally. It doesn't kind of wobble about. Works a treat. Let's see the blood that on your hand. That is the best way. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Let's see the hole you've just drilled in your hand. <laughs> yeah, big martyr they call it. <laughs> <laughs> that's superb, mate. That's really that's really good. I've I, I've seen um, uh, Glenn Martin do do kind of fancy stuff with because he's a drummer from, I don't know whether you knew, but Glenn Martin was a drummer from the 60s. Uh, and, yeah. and he's, a, he's a very established uh, flat bow archer. Uh, does this thing where he kind of flicks and spins the arrow down another one. And he can oh, tell, yeah. and he can tell, that, yeah. And he can tell by the vibration of as, as it bumps down the other shaft. Um, but I, I like your, uh, I like that method. It's superb. I'm, I will try it later. <laughs> Probably not with this medieval arrow, <laughs> <laughs> with a point like that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a good conversation. I think this is uh, I think this is going to be. I, I hope it's going to be watchable, and I think that if uh, if people are happy to um, leave their leave their comments and uh, and. Um, uh, any suggestions that they might have about who we who we should talk to or what combinations of people would be an interesting combination to have on here um we try and do maybe one every couple of weeks um it might be uh, just a bit of fun especially during lockdown while we can't get out of <laughs> the woods yeah absolutely so um so pedro yeah thank you very much Thank what you. are you what are you going to do uh, are you are you practicing in the garden or are you are you just were you serious no, I'm about actually, i've i've i moved into a flat uh right, the last okay. couple of, of weeks so i've been actually shooting in my corridor um so you were so serious that, about that yeah <laughs> i was actually serious about that yeah indeed yes yeah, oh, okay. so my boss over here yeah cool okay man well listen we'll maybe see you um see you in a, in a couple of weeks time and uh yeah. you know in the woods sooner i hope not likely yeah. but i hope um I hope Roger, so. you, i know you're just gonna kind of carry on shooting in your gorgeous dingley dell in the back of your house yeah uh, i don't go down there too often to be honest because i 
I just get bored on my own. I, I need friends around. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of what it's all about, isn't it? And it's yeah. Uh, no, it is. It is. Yeah. But if if we meet up again in a couple of weeks, um, I might have a another bow to show you. I mean, we reflex deflex primitive bow. If it's not gone bang by then. Well, maybe we can sort of you can take take the uh, the iPad out in the garden and uh, and show us uh, the first yeah. couple of shots with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I do like to film the first couple of shots. To be honest, it's uh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, thanks okay. guys. Thanks for doing bow, bows well, and arrows. Thank you. We'll see you see thank you in the woods soon. Yeah. Take care. See you. See you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers, bud. Well, thanks for watching the second edition of Bows and Arrows. That was with Pedro Portella and Roger Massey from 1066 Archery down there in Battle in Sussex and myself Ian Nuttall. Please make sure that you leave any comments or suggestions of anyone that you'd like to see on the next edition of Bows and Arrows. The Bows and Arrows podcast has been made exclusively for the traditional Archery Fellowship Facebook page. So make sure you share with your friends or invite anybody you think might enjoy what we do. See you soon.